Welcome to Jenkins Documentation Office Hours. It's the 25th of February, 2022 in Asia, where we're focusing this time zone. For some of us, it's not quite the 25th yet, but it's the 25th of February, 2022 in Asia. Thanks for being here. Topics I've got on the agenda today include news, Shikot Africa Contributhon, adding a troubleshooting section, the switch from system five in it to system D. Oh, whoops, wait a sec. How did my other things not get on? What? Oh yes, that's right. And that was one that, this is one that needs some guidance because there's, I wanted to have a discussion here in the group about, about that specific one because it's, it's a structural question. What other topics need to be on our list for today? Oh, oh, let's see. Should we, uh, yeah, we've got, um, I had put on my list, the 2.3.3.3 two change log and upgrade guide. So let's be sure we at least have a brief talk about that one. Any other topics? Um, yes. One thing I am curious about yesterday is uh, does Jenkins has any tests that it performs like a normal project does? And I think I know the answer. I just wanted to ask it anyways. Tests? Like, uh, yeah, like uh, there's a product and uh, I see it currently in the uh, product I'm working with. So there's like some man manual regression tests that are written. So this is Jenkins has it or not? Because it, yeah, because uh, when we release something new, it um, it introduces some bugs. So I was thinking like, why uh, can we decrease those bugs? So just want to discuss on that. Oh, so you okay. mean the tests that run for CI? No, no, I think or, he was he was asking a different, well, just to be sure. So Diraj, I think you're asking about human beings running tests, not about machine, yes. not about automation yeah. running tests. Uh, okay. yeah, a set of tests on the UI, just to see, make sure that all, after uh, the uh, new uh, icons are introduced, I'll do some tests and see whether they are uh, not breaking anywhere or not uh, before releasing it to Jenkins. Uh, uh, I mean, to the public for the- Yeah, public. good question. Okay. Just curious, yes. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a good good topic. So added, any other topics that we need to include? Okay, then let's go ahead. So let's let's take these on news. So Jenkins 2.336 released. It had several fixes for image and icon issues, which may in fact be what's inspiring uh, Diraj's question. And the Jenkins 2.332.1 release candidate is available and ready for testing. It's got an open question about which Linux installer should we use? And uh, the, the discussions are happening in the Jenkins developers mailing list. So by all means, read the list. We'll have a brief discussion about it later here because there's a documentation impact that I want your input on. Okay, change log and upgrade guide is needed for 2.332.1. I'm not ready for that yet. Uh, so it's gonna take more work. The next opportunity we'll have to review it will be next Thursday. I'll probably send you all of you a request to review the content before then so that we can, I can get your feedback asynchronously. That's it for news. Now, Diraj, on to your question. Are there interactive tests that Jenkins performs? And I think you were saying specifically prior to a weekly release. Yeah, so I'll try to put paint the picture better mm -hmm. this time. So there's a product let's say, and it has some test cases predefined on uh, Polarian. 
and uh, those are like the manual tests uh, as per the web ui that it has similar to jenkins it's like click on this make sure this is seen and this is visible i mean uh, type this type that so they, there's like lots of uh, test cases now coming to jenkins um, does it have these test cases which are uh, I, I think i know the answer but uh, does it have all these test cases which are performed uh, before we release uh, any uh, new releases of jenkins so that um, we don't see some recurring issues uh, from the jenkins users and we tackle them before releasing it from our end so yeah so mine i got this uh, question because i was seeing some uh, icon issues so i thought uh, hey if uh, we had these test cases in place we would have uh, seen them uh, from our end before releasing it and uh, does does that explain it because i just woke up a few minutes ago <laughs> it, it, <laughs> i think i think it does uh, it does explain it and it's a it's a it, this is a really fun topic so so you've you've sort of touched on a hot button for me diraj but maybe not in the way you might expect so <laughs> this is great so uh no we don't have those types of descriptions and the reason we don't have those types of descriptions is most of the time those types of descriptions don't actually help us find bugs um, in many cases a, a scripted style of test which is what you're describing here and if you refer to refer to james bach uh, michael bolton um let's see who are some others kem kaner um for the, the the surprisingly high cost of using that style of testing compared to um, other styles of testing and the relatively low low benefit that's received, we do have um, regular explorers who uh, use the UI and report issues. And we do have uh, regular pull request reviewers who check that pull requests are okay. Um, now, but you, you may say, okay, but why didn't we detect 2.335's regressions, right? Why, how did those get past our regular explorers? Mm -hmm. Hmm. And, yes. and how do they get past the pull review process? Hmm. Yes. So, so let's let's talk. Or, or is is that sort of what you're asking, or is there something different you wanted to guide on? Uh, icons are breaking. Could we have uh, prevented that from our end before? That right. Exactly. Question. Yeah. So so and so let's if we if, so. The, the fundamental question, could we have, what should we do differently? What should or could we do differently to detect issues sooner, right? I, I think is what you're asking. So 2.335 had several bugs in visual elements. And it's that's a sort of a, a first for us. It's been a long time since we had that many bugs in visual elements. And if we look at the list of bugs in the change log, you'll see that, hey, this set here gives us a hint of the kinds of bugs we had. Like those, right? So if we're lucky, that will actually turn those into hyperlinks still. Oh, it does. Oh, that's good. So those those kind of reports, what could we do to to avoid them? And now there are several of them where we'd say, ah, well, let's see, what could we do?
and and should we let's see oh sorry one of those is bogus we'll delete that one it's nonsense and so if we look at those we can see all right let's look at this one an organization folder scan when it is not run was missing an icon but only when it was not run <laughs> if it had been run the icon was correct so oh. in order to detect this thing, you had to have defined an organization folder, look at the organization folder, not have run the organization folder and detect that. So you had to define the organization folder and have it initially disabled. Relatively obscure case that, that oh. would, would take some relatively sophisticated exploring and yet human beings detected mm. it quite rapidly because there are so many of us and and so we said oh whoops that's just wrong so you're saying like it's it was a very tricky edge case it, it was and there are several like this in that are that are really interesting edge cases but but when we have 300,000 installations edge cases are everywhere right so the reality is calling it an mm -hmm. edge case is not very satisfying because everyone sees edge cases because there are so many installations. Hmm. So, so yes. calling it an edge case doesn't excuse it. It just says, ah, okay, that's a, that's a tough one to decide how hmm. we would attack that generally. Right, exactly. Now, now maybe let's, let's look at several more just to get a sampling. So visually, right? There's a visual problem there. Let's look at another one just to get another visual thing. And, and then let's talk maybe Okay, so GitHub organization folders were not rendered correctly. Now, this mm -hmm. one was very visible on if you had a, let's see, what was the specific condition? It was that in order to see it, you had to, I, I forget the details, but there was, again, some rather obscure thing. However, it showed up for GitLab, Giddy, and, Git, and GitHub. And then we got an additional report after 336 was fixed that said, oh, and there's still a problem in one more case with Bitbucket. <laughs> and the Bitbucket one is really novel. So, so the Bitbucket one required that you have a very specific reverse proxy configuration in order to see it. <laughs> so, so most interesting. Now, back to the question, what could we have done to detect those? I wonder, could we, so, could we open every web page and check for, for broken images? Would that have helped us detect these problems much more rapidly? And by that, I mean having a machine do it, not having a person. Hmm. Yes. but. Uh as you said, in some cases, we need to have some configuration in place just to see whether it's break, uh, breaking or not. So we need to also tell machine that, hey, do this configuration, then go on and check for broken images. So, and and, so that, and that, be, hmm. well, go ahead. So that would be a little uh, difficult as well, right? To well, well that to one, so, so in many cases, we need specific plugins in order to see the issue, right? Yes, exactly. I think that's what you're saying. And so yes. for that one, uh, so we here we would need to find a broken a broken image detector. And here we would need to have interesting configurations. that are easy to start and stop. Hmm, right. And as it turns out, we have some interesting configurations that are easy to start and stop. Gavin Mogan has his interesting configurations. Mark Waite has his interesting configuration. And I think, Diraj, you've actually had access to my interesting configuration. It's this thing right here, right, with, oh, several thousand jobs of various forms that are testing various things. 
yes 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 right is it the gitty something yeah, well, yeah so this say? is this is my jenkins server but yes there's also it's also connected to a giddy server and to github and to bitbucket and all sorts of others mm -hmm. yeah makes sense so so yeah. back to if we could find a program that would walk through a, a an authenticated website and report to us all the broken images that might have been a really dramatic improvement for this I don't yet know of such a program, but I suspect they exist. Hmm, makes sense. Uh, okay. Would there be a way to characterize the plugins that, I mean, what the background was of this? Because I'm thinking if we have to check against every possible combination of plugins that you could install, that that's a very large number. And it certainly is. So, so oh, go ahead. Yeah, Kristen? I was just thinking, like, I can imagine that when people were reviewing this, they just took common things and they were like, oh, it works for what they're used to seeing. And so that's probably another reason why, because it's like, even if you were visually checking as a human, unless you knew to do certain types of cases, you were probably, you just look at what you have or like look at things that you know about and it rendered. <laughs> mm. I mean, not many people immediately disable a folder after they create it. So it's like, I can understand like having that, you know, that situation or, yeah, so just turns. Right, right. And, and uh, but, but a very good point. So my thought was, if we, if we get something like this thing, a, a check for broken images, anybody could run that against their own Jenkins controller and may be able to help us do these kinds of explore explorations. Mm. And it would just use whatever configuration they have. And okay, it's not every mm. possible combination, but it's probably a bunch of very interesting combinations that we'd get. Sure, mm. I think I still see like the people that probably end up using this the most are like you and Gavin. <laughs> I think it'd be, I'm not sure how often that would be run by people as they open a PR. Does that make sense? Right, right, yeah. uh, and, and agreed wholeheartedly. Yeah, okay. I, I don't, I don't know that this would be a viable. I mean, I don't know that. It, I guess it could be viable, but I have a hard time imagining that we would spend the money to host yeah. these that kind of test on every pull request because right. many pull requests don't change UI. Many exactly. pull requests don't make dramatic changes, and this would be probably very expensive. <laughs> Right. It takes takes quite a while to load every web page. Hmm. Yes. So, Diraj, did, did did that address your question? Any any further yes, questions? Um. No. No. Nothing as of now. I I got the idea and the full picture. Now it makes sense to me. But one last question. Just uh, remember it now. You were saying I pressed the hot button. So what, what was that about? <laughs> oh, sorry. That's that's there is a there is a multi port. The Association for Software Testing, Software Testing, AST, has a a multiple core series that includes uh, foundations of uh, let's see foundations. I think it's the first course. Bug advocacy is the second course. Um, so foundations of software testing, bug advocacy. Um, let's see what else. Test design, I believe, is their third third course. And um, each of these is a six week intensive course. Just to give you a hint, I flunked bug advocacy my first attempt. I failed. <laughs> And that was after 15 or 20 years in the business, I still failed the course the first try. So, so they're very serious about this particular, these courses and, and they are really cool. There's a, a brilliant book. The bug advocacy workbook is uh, five millimeters thick, right? 10 millimeters thick. So it's a thick book uh, filled with instructions on how to do a good job of submitting good bug reports. And that's just about how to write a good bug report and when you report wow. a bug and why and why you don't report a bug. 
So, so it's fascinating. And this, the, 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 the whole, the whole thing is, is just brilliant. And of course, Dr. Kaner and James Bach, Michael Bolton, and several others who were involved in creating it. It's, it's marvelous material. So yes, I'm deeply attached to it. Awesome. Good and a little embarrassed at having failed the first time, right? I mean, yeah. really, truly. <laughs> Good, good stuff. Okay. For sure. Yes. Anything else on that topic? I, I could, unfortunately, I could bore you for hours on that topic. So let's be careful. We don't <laughs> spend too much time on it. By the way, back yeah, to, think, you said something about we hmm. wouldn't run this against every PR, but we always talk about some tests that you don't run against, but maybe once a week, run right. against everything that's in master. At least, at least we might get a heads up on it before. I mean, you could say we run it the night before we release, but then that opens up a rather large possibility of getting like this would have been a mess what we have held the release then and how to explain it etc yeah and and i don't know that we would have but we certainly would have could have informed people that hey this this detected it so um that's i think it's worth considering could consider more layers of tests uh so do some things only weekly. Right. Right. Because, because it's there, there are, there are values to some tests. Some tests are more valuable than others. And, and we want to do the more valuable things more frequently, the less valuable things are the things that are less likely to detect a problem. Um, we may do them less frequently. Or the things that are a greater effort and a greater cost. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But cause well, in this case, I'm wondering if we had say been running this a few weeks ahead of, on master, would we have started to see some of these and would that have alerted us to be watching for them? Not really sort of because, because the changes, these bugs did not exist in the previous weekly. So they arrived within a period of a seven day of, a, of seven days. Okay. I'm just also wondering like, we can write these tests and stuff, but will we even have written the tests to catch these bugs? Because if That's, they're on like such, I mean, we, yes, we, we, we have there are a lot of users and stuff and it has like, you know, we, an edge case is, you know, going to hit more people, but at the end of the day, it's still an edge case. And would we have written the test to even do this in the first place? And then now we'll, like, and so we might not have even caught it anyway. And, and there's, right, that's, that's a very real risk that escapes are going to happen, right? Some bugs are going to get past us. And my thought with this technique was that it at least exercises the pages available from an arbitrary Jenkins server, from a controller. And if that controller has enough interesting configuration, it, it will probably tell us something useful. If it's not interesting configuration, then when we find a new bug, we add to its configuration so that next time that one won't, would be detected. The challenge I'm having right now is I'm not sure I know a program that can do this because web page, image loading in web browsers now is deeply attached to CSS apparently. And I don't know if you can get it without using the real web browser. So that's, that's the part I've, I haven't explored enough yet to see if this is really feasible as an idea. Did that address your question, Kristen? Did you? Did we... I don't know. I, I guess like I'm not a thousand percent convinced it's worth the resources. Mm, <laughs> but okay. but I'm like, but yeah, if it's caught, catching enough people's stuff, because I mean, how often are we making these changes? Like, I think a lot of this is because we're doing a lot of visual updates currently, right? So that is it's right. like if, if yeah. we're doing it now, like these things would have. Yeah, you know, hindsight 2020. 20, it would have been a lot yeah. better to have it in place before we did a lot of these updates. And I'm quite frankly not sure when we're going to do another overhaul for something like this, where we would run into these problems. I mean, I can maybe maybe if we're planning on doing any type of visual change, like coming up soon, like and that maybe is something that gets developed ahead of that. So maybe we just this is a learning opportunity, like a learning that we take out of this, and then do it the next time we decide to do UI updates. But I'm just like, man, I just keep looking at this like if. It's going to be relatively stable 
we're putting a lot of effort into running something that's just going to keep returning. Yeah, good point. And for so every for everything, and it's just also a lot of effort on everyone's part for something that might not actually be worth it. Right. So it, I wonder to to address yours. It may be that it'd be more valuable just to admit explorers guided by what they know has been changed in pull requests um, may be much faster than any automation we could do. Okay, they're not as repeatable, but we don't actually care about repeatability. We care about detecting problems. Right. Right. Yeah, so I just think I'm like, oh man, we're taking a lot of time and it's like, could that time be used for something else? Or if like, we do know that there's a massive view, like another UI effort or something coming up with new icons or anything else, then maybe I would see a little bit more. But to me, it's like, now we're just creating a whole bunch of tests that will always be clean. Right, and, right. And it's, and it's just a lot of resources, like, like me, a lot of resources to spin everything up, a lot of, a lot of time, people's time to write all this stuff and then to mm -hmm. maintain it. Um, so yeah and and that's sort of why i was thinking this thing would just look at everything it would admit to not being not being specific to anything if any page is detected with a broken image that's a, a that's questionable and and then humans uh, reviewing pull requests again is is nice and focused but you're right i i can't see investing writing specific test cases even for these individual bugs i really I look at those bugs and I think, you know what? I don't get enough benefit out of trying to check for the existence of that icon. Human beings were found right. very, very rapidly, right. very right. rapidly. Yes, yeah. That's, and that's this is just one, one possibility. That's the other thing is, I mean, there we still know there is some validation that's best done by a human that it's just hard to read. Right, right. And, yeah. Like I remember the Jenkins 2 upgrade, like and there was a lot of manual testing in that because it was a lot of what are people doing? <laughs> It's mm -hmm. like deal, right? It's like a, that's a lot going to be a lot faster than any type of like test, but yeah, it's, it required it. That was just a massive effort on the whole, but it's just kind of like a uh, maybe that is something. If we know that we're having um, UX changes, it might be. I, I don't know if the UX SIG is still active. I was like, it but is, maybe that's not, it, it okay. is. It is very active. Oh, okay, yes. good. Because I was like, maybe that's something that their SIG should look at too, like a something well, that. And, and right now we're very much in UI revisions. There are, yeah, there are so, rapid right, so. changes happening, but but again, I'm not sure I want to risk slowing down those rapid improvements. They are they are really breathtaking. They're doing such a good job that I think this kind of breakage for me is an acceptable result from from the fast movement that we're making. Yes, it's it's awkward saying, "Wow, that was a bunch of stuff that was broken," but one week later it's fixed. Right. Right. Yes. And that's a cool story about these these bugs is almost all of these are fixed already in 336. Nice. So it they didn't spend a long time broken and and it was total time broken we detected most of them 2 days after the within 2 days after the release and they were fixed 2 days later. And they were a little bit of ugliness but they weren't anything serious like they destroyed well, yeah, well, yeah. They like were, they were, they were like certainly... you couldn't get into something anymore because it was like you couldn't. Yeah, right, they, they, they were <laughs> frustrating to users, but not damaging to functionality. Right, you and didn't, the only you didn't people lose that... the ability to do work. Sorry, and the only users that would have seen these are users who are on edge anyway, right? Right, it's running. Like, it's not like it got into an LTS where it was like. That's correct. In so... fact, they, these were specifically introduced at this point in the cycle because they are probably eight eight weeks or more away from an LTS. Okay. They won't be eligible for LTS for at least till at least June. Right. So the users who are seeing this might have a little bit more for um, understanding and flexibility and maybe a little bit more forgiveness because they know that they're using something that is edge. Weekly. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's weekly. So it's like... Right. So actually we could say that the system is working because weeklies are known to be vulnerable to certain things. Yeah, there's certainly Daniel Beck would remind me that weekly is still expected to be production ready. Right, right, yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> and he's right. We don't yes. we don't get a we don't get a pass because we because it's weekly, it's right? Weekly. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, especially in terms of security and stuff. But yeah, it's like it's right. just kind of like maybe I, I don't know, like maybe they their sig should look into some of this stuff too, like if they want to do the testing, but I'm not sure it's worth like standing up as a 
from an yeah, event. Yeah, well, just because everyone like time, oh, and resources. But anyway, no, I've said it. I've said my piece. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> so, all right. What actually strikes me is um, how many pages. I mean, if you told me to go and look at every web page, uh -huh. I'm not sure I would do it. Oh no, I mean, you I would shouldn't. Start, no. That's, that's well, no, a no, program's no. Job. I'm not talking about. I'm saying that. I wouldn't have a linear path through that I could be sure I'd hit everyone. Right, right, exactly. And so one thing, I mean, one thing we could have is a list of these somewhere so that you could have 10 people and they each did 10% of the, or something like, you know. Yeah, see, my problem with that kind of thing is it's, that's very human intensive. Mm -hmm. and, and this open every web page is, is very much robot, right? It's a machine can do, should be able to conceptually do this and and therefore it, it's just it's expensive to run but it's still cheaper than putting 10 human beings to do it but i mean but we're saying that we do have people who are looking at this so well we have people who explore yeah okay That's... all right yes ready to go on to the next topic sure. early okay so I think I want to shift gears just a little. If you're okay with it, I'd like to take on this topic next because I need some guidance. Are you okay if I if I meddle with the order of the agenda Absolutely. to get your guidance? Good for me. Yeah. Okay. So, sure. so here's what we've got: the Linux installers in 2.335 switch from using system five in it to using system D as their way to manage the service. And I think it's brilliant because whereas previously, how do you configure Red Hat was different than how do you configure Debian? And that's really messy in documentation. It's also more prone to bugs. There were eight or 10 bug fixes that came as a result of this switch. So nice improvement in general. However, it's a new thing. System D is not the same thing we used to use to manage services, stopping them, starting them, configuring them, modifying their configuration, reading their logs, etc. This is new. And, and during this transition, I learned a bunch of things that I wasn't aware of. And I think I'm a pretty experienced Unix administrator. So, so the, the experience was good. Now the question to, to all of us is where would a page on managing system D services belong in the Jenkins documentation? So now I'm opening at the documentation site. Meg, I think you're you're usually our our first and best thinker about these kind of things. It's Suggestions, allowed. recommendations. Okay, let's look at well, it seems like that would be system administration. Okay, so system administration. Let's see. Get most of this. Well, a lot are there going to be a lot of these changes that they have to make right away? No, uh -uh. these are this is this is material for so. Oh, a good point. Here we got viewing logs. So this one already will need a change, and it's actually got a change now for system. So, so I think that lobbies in favor of your argument. It should be in system administration. Good. Okay. Others, or oh. sorry, Meg, I interrupted. No, no, I'm still reading and thinking. So go, go on. I'm... Even for me, first guess was system administration. And that is coming from the fact that I have no much, not much background. So that is where I would go as well. OK, good. All right. I think we had that discussion, too. What's the difference between the managing and system administration? And it was sort of managing was supposed to be more routine stuff. And then administration was more sophisticated. Um, what about the Kubernetes chapter? Is that going to take a hit from this? Does this affect Kubernetes also? It or does not. This one, this one is unrelated to Kubernetes because, because this system D thing is not used for Docker containers. Uh -huh. It's only used when you're actually on an operating system that is doing more than just managing a single process at, in a container. Okay. So, so this is I installed on Red Hat, or I installed on Ubuntu, or I installed on Debian, or I installed on Suzy, oh, and in so, those. So, oh, go ahead. Make so, almost sure. at that point, do we need to have some references inside of installing Jenkins too? We do, and 
And there will be a section, there is already a section here in installing that talks okay. about how you use system control to do some of these things. So those things are described here. How do you start it? How do you stop it? What I was thinking though, is that there's, this is linear flow, the starting and stopping. Right. And not so much reference material, whereas I was assuming this this other page is more reference material. Oh, okay. Okay. Here's how you do this thing, and here's how you do this thing, not linear flow. Right. And we but and we want some place where we actually explain what this is system be, you know, have sort of that background. And then other right. places you could say you have to do this because of that. Go over there and read it. So, so would right. this be like another high level? Because you see our system administration, we have the back of restoring, monitoring, then administering Jenkins on Kubernetes. Would this be a administering Jenkins on Linux? And then like mm. a page there? Mm. Would oh, be running system. Oh. Oh. oh, okay, go for it. Go for it, Mike. No, I was thinking it would be something more like system service, managing system services. Okay. Yes, you, uh, good Good question though. I think back to your title. So is, could you say that again, Kristen? You, oh, I was just copying what this is, administering, administering Jenkins on Kubernetes. And it's, then it turns into, is like, is this kind of administering? Yeah, right there. It's like, is this administrating Jenkins on Linux or is this, or is this kind of more, like would it fall under a page like this as like a section on system D? So, so now I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to describe why I think it shouldn't and let's test that. Okay. So okay, that, that's, thanks, cool. <laughs> that's, that's excellent because thank you for asking the question because I had not even considered the question. So a Linux administrator could choose to use the Jenkins war file and manage it themselves, either with a Docker container or with their own, their own setup without using system D at all. So my thought was this thing needs to be very specific to system D and it's relatively involved because, well, because here are all the different topics that I identified we would need to describe in it just at first attempt. And this is, this is by someone who's relatively inexperienced with, with this thing. So I found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight topics. And so for me, I thought, you know what? It's it's not Linux. It is actually Linux specific, yeah. but it's not the only way to do things on Linux. There are there are other ways. So, for instance, there are some Linux operating systems still that use System Five in it and don't. They've intentionally not chosen System D, and so for them, this section won't matter. They won't read it. So, did that? Does 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 my does my argument persuade you or not so much? <laughs> okay, not so much. Not, not, not so, so much, much is a fine. And I just answer. think like it would be a system or it would be a section within a page of Linux. So if you had the option, you would be able to see it. Like I'm almost like I'm actually kind of interested now. It's like, oh, we don't have one for Windows. <laughs> so like come down and that and it's like, oh, I wonder if that's like because oh, I know the Windows is a whole process thing as well. Um, but or at least like maybe since there's not a lot of there's no it's just still a little under construction triangle um, for the Kubernetes one. I, I didn't know if like this is something that is like a, okay, I'm on Linux, I click here, and then here's the different ways I can use it on Linux. D does that make sense? Like, or? Yeah. Well, you can always say a, no. I was like, like, it's, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. I, I don't want to get into the, into the discussion of all the variants of Linux oh, okay. that, that they could do because this one already is has enough interesting things in it that 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 need to be described i'd like to describe one path and recommend it and okay. tell those people who are doing exotic stuff like like this who are staying on system five they're a relatively small group and tell them sorry you're gonna figure that sure. out on your own sure okay but if we were going to if we were going to have documentation about running Jenkins on Linux, there would be a lot of subjects beyond system D in it, right? Uh, there would be. So there'd be things like, how do you configure it to do mail? Or how do you, I mean, you can imagine all sorts of things that an operating oh, system- resources. So there's been a long one that you may need to modify some, you know, the number of slots, number of files you can have open or something like that. Right, right, yeah. And- uh... I'm 
but yeah, it's like I guess the thing is like is is system D as a topic enough alone to be a high like a standalone page, or is it like information that would be on another page? Yeah. And my argument was like I think I I would see it personally as something that's on a like on a page, um, but. Uh, I don't feel, I don't care enough. I was like, like I'm not but, I don't have strong enough feelings. Like I, I'm like not I'm not gonna this is not the hill I wanna die on. <laughs> like, no, it's like, no, yeah. we will have it to, it will not be on its own page. <laughs> like that type of deal. So if we if other people think it'd be good on a page, then I'm fine. So with that, so let me see if I can if I can persuade you why I think it's it's large enough. There's three examples here. So here's one from DigitalOcean. Notice the size of this scroll bar for the description of system control. So, so this is system D on, on DigitalOcean and they're not even an operating system provider. Now, if we look at Red Hat's description page, theirs is even bigger on how you do system D. So my, my thinking was, wow, this is, and, and this thing, its goal really oh, yeah, is to be the one yeah. and complete total management solution for processes and services on Linux systems. And, and that makes it very, very large. Gotcha. But our part of it is is not as large as that, but it's, it's I think, still got lots of interesting topics. Good, all right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the guidance, okay. Um, by the way, on a related subject, being obnoxious, under managing Jenkins, we have a, a section called Jenkins features controlled with system properties. Uh -huh. nice. Under this definition of system administration, I think that's something that might belong in system administration. Oh, okay. All right. So, <laughs> I mean, I, isn't, again, that's another little bit This we get into all the, um, um, yes. Right. So where you yeah. get all the stuff you put on your Java command line. Right. And, and that and that's I think that's consistent with our picture that we think managing Jenkins is really a description of things that are visible and directly accessible under the manage Jenkins page. Right. So right. so configuring the system, configuration as code, tools, whereas this one is relatively niche. Right. It, it, right. This is, and and probably and so what we need is a redirect that points from this location into system administration, and we move the page. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, everybody, okay with? So, Krista, I'm I'm I, noting oh, yeah, your, no, I'm, your I'm okay. concern. <laughs> and continue. Yeah, I'm okay with putting it as a top level page. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of. Okay. okay. Great. All right. So. We've got about 15 minutes left. Here are the three topics I had. Any of these that are particularly hot for others, one versus another? Not for me, they're all interesting. Oh, oh, Diraj, did you have any questions on Google Summer of Code or its documentation related topics that we needed to address? Uh, you mean the screenshot automation idea? Uh, any any topics related? Any topics you want to discuss? Yes, I do have one, and okay. uh, I, so it's related to uh, pipeline steps documentation generator. Okay. So I spent some like a good amount of time to understand the current code code base in order to see how things are working before thinking about proposing some. UI related changes. So, uh, so to do that in greater detail, I wanted to run it via our debugger because I just got introduced to debugger and I think it's so cool. And just wanted to run it via that and see what are the values that are there in the this this variable, that variable, what I, what is getting fetched, how is it getting used, how is it getting stored. So that's the aim from my side. So after that, I'll be able to think about, hey, I can use this data to propose this UI change. So question is, how can can we run it? Can we run this project uh, on debugger mode on any IDE, let's say Eclipse? Because I tried that, I see saw saw an error. So I thought let's first discuss maybe. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I think I think that I was using it. Now I'm 
I, I've used NetBeans, so Mark uses, and I think that was what I was using the last time I was working on that code base. Kristen, what, what IDE do you use typically? IntelliJ? No, um, VSC, Visual Studio Code. Okay, all right. Kristen yeah. uses Visual Studio Code. So you might try the one of those two. Yeah, so I'm going to say like I've never tried running it with a debugger. Always oh, okay. Handy console <laughs> or logging or just kind of um, yeah to see what's. And I I think that I did run it in the debugger, but because there was there were some places where I was confused, and usually when I'm confused, the first thing I do is bring up the debugger. So. It's been a little bit since I've tried running it, so I'll say like I'd have to look at it again. <laughs> like, look yeah. at it again and try running it again. But yeah, like um, a lot of it too, like comes from but a lot. Of, there's some areas where it's like there's the trust that uh, the plugin manager stuff ends up uh, kind of worked or like taking lifted directly from the plugin manager code. So right. knowing that that stuff is like all right, well it works to load Jenkins stuff. Um, some of the information in there. Was a little a little hairy like it was a lot of digging through um jenkins core to figure out what was going on um but yeah so 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 if you'd like diraj we could we could consider next week we might do some exploring to see hey could we get it ready and show you a tour in a debugger it, for me, it's I'd probably spend thirty minutes, and then if I didn't have wasn't successful in thirty minutes, I'd give up. <laughs> Just tell you, I, 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 I couldn't invest more than that. Who actually wrote that? Exactly. That makes sense. <laughs> that software. <laughs> me. <laughs> so yeah, no, I I, I need the to look at it again. You wrote the step generator. She did. Yes. Yeah, I did yeah, not like, know that. Okay. Oh, congrats. I, well, no, I wrote this the the one that does for the like I didn't write like the actual like the annotations and all that stuff for the stuff. I just wrote the the thing that pulls all the documentation for the website. Right. So yeah. The generator. <laughs> like, yeah. Um so yeah, I gotta look at that again. But it's it's been it's been a couple <laughs> it's been several years. So, so did <laughs> you did, but did you use Visual Studio Code to develop that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. how did you debug it then? A lot of console log. <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so I run it. I basically like, stood it up a whole bunch of times, and then just kind of ran it. Like, or, like, trust in that. Yeah, I did a lot of console log debugging, um, to, because I was trying to make output into a file or into like ASCII doc anyway. So a lot of it was just kind of like, what am I printing in ASCII? Doc? <laughs> like, is this actually showing up in ASCII doc? So yeah, like a lot of that type of situation. But yeah, no, I didn't use the debugger. I guess I'm maybe not the best world's best developer, but yeah, it worked for me. So, hey, you you know, Mark didn't ask me what <laughs> IDE I use because he knows I use VI. So, <laughs> so we're good. VI is yeah, my okay. favorite GUI. It's my favorite IDE. Yes, so, I like VI too <laughs> for simple things. But <laughs> so, Kristen, you use the system dot out dot print ln statements, right? Well, I, there's like a the logger, value. whatever the logger statements. So like, yeah, you can use oh, this a print line or you can use like, if there's, the, I think there's a logger in there, you can use the logger. Um, okay. Print stuff. Right. Okay. I'll but but it, with that. Just to be able to figure out what's going on. A couple yeah. And Diraj, as far as I understand, it should be usable in a debugger. Eclipse yeah. is not the most commonly used debugger. Uh, I think IntelliJ mm -hmm. is the most common right now in the Jenkins community. Visual Studio Code mm -hmm. is a strong player. Yeah. And then there are a few <laughs> few holdouts that still use Apache NetBeans. They're they're somewhat high visibility holdouts, but <laughs> there are holdouts. I used to love NetBeans. <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> Much more than Eclipse. <laughs> yeah. I like how I liked how lightweight. Visual Studio Code was, especially yeah. many, many years ago. It was incredibly lightweight. It was very nice. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Did did that sure. address your question at least as well as we can in the time we've got, Diraj? Yes, because uh, I see that VS Code is an option. So I'll, I, I, have exp I, I do work with it. So I'll try to run it on VS Code and see how it goes and 
then I'll ask my question directly on Gator channel on GSOC channel, right? Great. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Sure. Thanks. All right. Okay, I think last topic then is, well, let's, let's in the few minutes we've got left, how about let's talk about Contributhon. One of the questions I have is I'm looking for mentors during the Africa daylight hours to help with some of these project ideas. And so if you're available, send me email or let me know if you're willing to assist there. I put several of your names here in danger mode saying, okay, um, I know Meg, you, I think Kristen, you as well had mentored last year. And so if you're willing again, please let me know and we'll, we'll think how we approach it. What, what are African daylight hours roughly? Uh, oh, let's see. So that means it's when it's 11 o'clock my time, it's just ending their working day. 11 o'clock at night here is ending. no uh, a.m. 11 o'clock. So think, think, think Europe, Europe working times. So when you okay. think about your overlap with Damien as yeah. a good example of, right. of Africa working, Africa working oh, with my entire department now. And, and they're yes. mostly going to want to do stuff after working hours or is it going to be during work don't know that's okay. that's part of the complexity right because if they're students they may right. be available right within their their working day right and and then we've got angelique jard who's agreed to be a mentor and she's right there in the in european time zone so right. yeah so we've got we've got some good candidates there but just looking for more okay um yeah, I'm, I would be willing to do it um, as long as they're doing projects where they need a writer and, and right. I'm not doing a meeting where every issue is, we wish Mark was there. <laughs> well, well, and, and if, if the issues are coding issues, then, then we need to be sure we've got people there to support them in coding questions. Right. Absolutely. And speaking of which, do we have, once again, we don't have any projects in our proposal that are really just writing projects, do we? We do not. Well, well, I don't know, you might, some of the, some of the inclusive naming things are awfully close to writing projects. Right. Um, what I was thinking about is whether this troubleshooting section for the user handle handbook is a potential um, project that could oh. actually be done by a team of, P of participants because I mean it would be a lot of research and trying and you know talking to people you know it would be a chance to learn a, a lot of good documentation skills mm. and there's so much there and it I did get the impression from our participants last year that a lot of them might have been more comfortable working in a team you know, working towards the same goal. It's it's something else. We could try it, and if it worked, we could eventually propose it to GSOC. But everything we, we do now is individual things, and that might be a, you know. And then, of course, the problem with them is one of one of one of we have three people on it. One of them bails out. Do the other two get hurt? But but, but if they get anything, they get done is positive, right? We don't exactly. Yeah, that's. That's that's akin to this same story to test the tutorials, right? If we if we did troubleshooting as a team, yeah, interesting idea. Good suggestion. Thanks. It struck me because I'm sitting there, who is going to write this and when? And it's I'm thinking of something like a year from next show Tuesday, you might have resources for it. Right, exactly. And because because last year the participants, I don't think any of them were particularly interested in growing up to be technical writers, but sign up indicated that there were some candidates out there that were very interested in this so and, and that i haven't had the sense of that one way or the other but she's when she when she said in a recent meeting that project management may also be i think we can consider broader broader cases than just software development right so we could ask her, i mean if nobody applies for it then it's a moot point but right but if exactly. we put it out there as a possibility um, and nobody applies for it. We have, we're not any farther behind than we are now with it. Right, exactly. Yep. Good, okay. 
Uh, okay, I'm done. Now back to she code in general. It, actually, that's covered all the topics that I had, and I confess okay. it's been a very long day for me. So I'm I'm at the edge of saying, shall we call this done for today? And that gives you a four minute break to your GSOC sure. meeting. No, no, no GSOC meeting tonight. Today was was Europe time for GSOC, so I'm actually done. I'm going to go to bed and take a, take okay. some sleep. Can you stop the recording? And I have one question for you after you. Stop I can the stop the recording. Um, just want to know how Colleen is. <laughs>